Welcome to the Colby Cast, episode 94. Thank you for joining us. Today, Joan Claire Fitzpatrick, Jamie Leatherby, and Michelle Kim join us to discuss Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. One of the founders of this program, Sophia Cavalletti, once said, To the littlest ones, we give tiny morsels of the richest of foods. We'll hear about the rich foods that are offered in this ministry and how we can provide this food to our own children in our own homes. We hope that you'll enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Bonnie, liturgical musician, popcorn and podcast fanatic, and Colby homeschooling mom to four lads and lasses of middle and high school age. And this is Stephen, homeschooling father of five and director of development for Colby Academy. When our four kids were little, we took a church bag to mass with us every time we went. This wasn't just any bag, it was imported from Washington, D.C. by my parents and sister and featured a quote by Pope Benedict XVI, the one who has hope lives differently. Into this bag, we tucked several picture books, including one called A is for Altar, B is for Bible by Judith Lang Main. Reading about the author, I noticed that she was part of a children's catechetical program called Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I was curious about the program and thought it sounded wonderful from what I could tell. Alas, the program wasn't offered anywhere in our area and I wasn't in a position to get it started. I'm happy, though, to say that now many parishes around here offer it. Our guests today include a familiar voice, Mrs. Michelle Kim, Colby Online Instructor of English and Homeroom. Hello. Hello, Bonnie. Thanks for having me back. Of course. And two members of the Colby Advising Staff, Mrs. Joan Claire Fitzpatrick and Ms. Jamie Leatherby. Welcome to the Colby Cast, ladies. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Bonnie. These three ladies are well-versed in the CGS approach, which I was delighted to hear can be applied not only in a parish setting, but also in homeschool and in online classical environments. That's our topic today, but first let's catch up with Michelle and get to know Joan Claire and Jamie a bit. Michelle, we've enjoyed our visits with you on episodes 70 and 87, which we'll link in our show notes. Last time you were here, you told us about the hoops you were jumping through to board your dog before a trip. How'd that end up going? Sadly, I have to report that our doggy flunked out of doggy daycare on the first day. Oh, no. But my college, my college age sons came to the rescue and we were still able to take our trip. And now I'm repaying them for their act of generosity by hosting them and uh, several of their friends. I'm currently living in a house of eight boys Oh. All by myself uh, during Franciscan and University of Dallas's spring break, and we okay. are having a blast. <laughs> I bet. What what fortunate fellows to be staying with you. How did you come to know and get involved in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? I came to know about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd when my now 20-year-old was four, and we enrolled him in a local atrium where Catechesis of the Good Shepherd takes place. I responded to an email from a dear friend of mine that said, come bring your child to a place where he or she can encounter the face of God that he needs to see the most. And I thought, that's where I want my son to be. Hmm. I knew nothing else about it, but I discovered very quickly that CGS was unique and special because we went to daily mass one day and the priest came out wearing a red chasuble for a memorial of a martyr. And my son said, mommy, it's Pentecost. And the priest froze and spun around and looked at me and said, what did he just say? And I said, well, he's in this place called the atrium and they have a liturgical color song and they learn that the color red is for Pentecost. And he knelt down fully vested for mass in front of my four-year-old son. And he said, you are absolutely right, Elijah. I wear red on Pentecost, but I wear red on other very special days in our church too. So we've never looked back. I eventually became formed as a catechist in all the levels from infant up through age 12 and even experimented a little bit with confirmation preparation using this approach. And I'm very privileged and blessed to be a formation leader for adults now to train them to become level one catechists. Wow. 
Joan Claire, I understand you have a homeschooling background yourself and know you to be an accomplished artist. Would you tell the listeners about that and how you got involved with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, which we'll, we'll probably be referring to as CGS for short throughout this, and whatever else you'd like us to know? Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I, I did grow up in a, one of the early uh, pioneer homeschooling families. My mother started homeschooling in the 70s before it was a name. Um, <laughs> And it's just been um, a beautiful part of her, of my education as a homeschooler, um, that she used a lot of concrete materials and put a big focus on visuals in our artistic um, development alongside our academic learning. So I really think that my mother, through the homeschooling environment that she created through a rich homeschooling environment is a big part of why I ended up becoming an artist. So. I, um, I was able to study uh, with a couple different professional artists in their ateliers as an apprentice through the years. And just this last year is the first time I've started to put some of my own work into shows. So that's been an exciting, exciting thing. And I think that's a, something that actually drew me to Catechesis of the Good Shepherd because the environment is such a big part of the concept of the method of CGS. And there's a lot of um, artistry to the materials that the students are working with, as well as a lot of a focus on beauty as part of how you're bringing the children to God. So my attraction to CGS is tied back to that homeschooling environment that had a rich focus on the visual arts as a way of learning as well as my own development. Um, but, but for the story of how I got connected to CGS, I was actually a college student at Christendom in Front Royal and I was at the local parish for mass frequently and I would see these young children, three, four, five years old in the front row of mass and, and extremely attentive to everything that was going on. And it, it made me curious because that's not typical for kids at that age. They're usually <laughs> climbing on the pews and running down the aisle and distracting everyone. And these children were so incredibly attentive. And I remarked on this to another uh, mom in the parish and she said, oh, those are the atrium children. And I was like, what's, what's the atrium? Like, what is this? Uh, and she told me about CGS and the, the atrium environment, which is where the catechesis happens. Um, so not long after that, my older sister actually was invited to do level one catechesis training and um, asked me if I'd be interested in doing it with her. And I did as an exploratory thing and uh, just fell in love with it, fell in love with how the children encounter God. Um, and proceeded to work a, a, as a level one catechist for the next three years. So, wow. yeah, it's it's a really incredible gift of a catechetical method, and I'm so excited to talk about it with you today. I'm excited to hear more about it. And Jamie, my kids enjoyed hearing your story at the recent vocations retreat, and of which Joan Claire was also a big part. Would you take us to the moment when you learned about Colby, and also about yourself, both outside of your advisor role and in relation to CGS? Yes. Well, thank you, first of all, for having us here. Sure. Um, so for me, I, I guess my first experience with CGS was um, when a parish, a woman from my parish told me about it. And the parish school associated um, had CGS for the Catholic school kids. And so she said, oh, you should come and observe. Um, and so I went and I had a few of my cousin's kids actually in that class that I got to observe. Um, and my background, I have my degrees in elementary education and my teaching credential. So she knew, you know, I loved kids. Um, I like the formation of kids, education. So she just invited me to that. So I just got to watch her. Um, I just, you know, sat there and observed it all and it was all new for me. And then fast forward, it was years, years later that I got, that CGS came back around for me, but I, um, heard about Colby. Um, I saw a job posting and it was an hour away from my home where I was living. And so I applied and then they interviewed me. It was all within a week, actually, that they brought me in, they interviewed me, um, and I moved an hour away from Sacramento to Napa, California. And I lived in uh, Napa where the headquarters of Colby are. 
Um, so that's how it started. And then it was an email from, I think it was Mary Rolls, the CEO of Colby, that sent out to all the Colby staff um, in the area and said that the local school in Napa was going to be hosting a training for CGS um, at the day school, Colby Trinity, um, there in Napa. And so that's how I started. I started going to that and uh, meeting all these other uh, beautiful women in the area um, that also had a desire to learn about CGS. And for me, right off the bat from the trainings, I just saw, well, I guess my own, my personal background was I was in cloistered religious life and Colby was my first job that I got following leaving um, the convent, the monastery. And to have these tra this training in CGS, it was right off the bat that I just thought, this is like a monastery for kids. Mm -hmm. um, there's this beautiful contemplation and silence that you're teaching kids from a very young age. Um, level one starts at age two and a half. And my trainer, uh, Jennifer Bell, was great. It was just the women in, the, in it, it was, um, and her that just speaking about this for the first time in these trainings, that I just had a strong sense that you're teaching a life of silence and a life of prayer and contemplation. You're just rooting it in these kids from a very young age that's so different. Uh, from, you know, sitting down with a theology textbook and learning, you know, your sacrament prep or things like that. Um, so, yeah, that's how I, I began was with that formation. And then I also got to do some trainings with the Marian Sisters of Santa Rosa who were learning it as well. Um, so to be in a class with, with religious who were learning the formation uh, was very special too. Um, and then from there, I actually... I, I took a pause from Colby and I taught in a Montessori Catholic school because I loved CGS so much and my background was in education. So I wanted to kind of combine it all together and teach in a Montessori way, um, English and reading and everything um, at a school that also had an atrium. So that, that led me to pause Colby and to work in the Montessori school. And so I got to, you know, witness my own students in the atrium. Um, to go through CGS. And then, yeah, um, from there, I mean, this is kind of the, uh, a longer story, but from there, I moved across the country. And then I, st um, after teaching, um, because my, my fiance now is in Ohio, so making that move across the country, I ended up starting back up with Colby again. Um, so here we are. Yeah. It's nice to have you back with us. Oh. Alrighty, so for those unfamiliar with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, could you give us a bit of background on the program? I like to call the history of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd the tale of a little boy, a book, and a library mouse. Hmm. It is a true tale. There once was a little boy named Paolo who lived in the city of Rome. It was 1954 and Paolo was preparing for his first Holy Communion. Paolo's mother, in helping him to prepare, realized that Paolo just wasn't getting it. Paolo loved soccer, he loved playing with his friends, but she didn't see in him a love for the Lord. Being a good Catholic mother, she sought help. Paolo's mother went to a woman in her parish named Sophia. Sophia was a devout Catholic, and she was also a renowned Hebrew scholar who had worked with the Vatican on Christian Hebrew relations. Paolo's mother said, Sophia, I want my son to know the Lord. I want him to love his holy word in scripture. And no one knows scripture like you do. Will you teach him? Sophia, who had studied alongside rabbis from all around the world, who was unmarried with no children of her own and no experience with children, replied, no. <laughs> but Paolo's mother, being a good Catholic mother, persisted. And in Paolo's mother's persistent knocking, Sophia recognized the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And finally, she said yes. One Saturday morning, Paolo's mother dropped him off at Sophia's posh Roman apartment and left him there crying with Sophia. Paolo was crying because it was Saturday morning and he wanted to be playing soccer with his friends. Sophia led him to her dining room table and she did the only thing that she knew to do. She opened up her Bible with Paolo to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and they began to read together. But Sophia read with Paolo that day the way that she had read scripture with those rabbis from all around the world, 
opening up each and every word as a treasure box and contemplating it with him. Two hours later, when the doorbell rang and Paolo's mother came to pick him up, he began to cry again, but this time he was crying because he didn't want to leave. Sophia recognized in that initial encounter with Paolo and the word several things. First, she noticed that Paolo was already in a relationship with the Lord, that it just needed to be given the time and the space and the opportunity to grow. She realized that she herself had had a genuine encounter with the Lord through looking at scripture with Paolo. She also realized that for an active seven-year-old little boy that that wouldn't be enough. And so in her humility, she agreed to continue to work with Paolo, but she went searching for some help. And she was introduced to Gianna Gobi, who was a trained Montessorian who had worked alongside Maria Montessori herself. And Gianna helped Sophia to start making materials for Paolo and his friends, the group was growing, based on liturgy. Gianna shared with Sophia that Maria Montessori had actually had a little altar area in her children's homes, but never really quite knew how to grow it. Uh, that, that wasn't her particular focus. And so together, Sophia and Gianna continued to work with these young children, looking at scripture and liturgy. And from that mustard seed of encounter with God, his word, and Sophia and Paolo, from that little mustard seed grew what is now this mustard tree of CGS. CGS is offered in over 37 countries throughout the world. And Sophia herself never went back to her previous work. She continued to work with children for the rest of her life and she lived to be nearly 100 years old. And at the end of her life, in an interview, she told the interviewer, the children saved me. And the interviewer asked, well, what do you mean by that? She said, oh, I was a little mouse in the library and they opened up the whole world for me. In these beginnings of CGS, we see these two pillars of the catechesis of scripture and liturgy, and also one of its defining characteristics, which is that shared religious experience of the child with an adult. And this is our faith, isn't it? Jesus is the word made flesh. We are people who listen to his voice in the word and we consume his flesh in the Eucharist. And through CGS, the children have this place where they can fall in love with God and encounter him in scripture and in the liturgy, and we as adults get to witness that and grow in our own relationships with the Lord. That's beautiful. Can you help us visualize the setting and how the program works? Catechesis of the Good Shepherd takes place in a prepared environment known as the atrium. We know that the atrium is a place in Roman buildings as the entryway into the church but it has significant theological and church history meaning as well. Joan Claire mentioned earlier about how she was drawn to the artistic beauty of this prepared space. And when the world was celebrating the 50th anniversary of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, ex bambini or children that used to be in the atrium were invited to share in this celebration with Sophia and with many of the other catechists who had worked in in CGS over the years. And one of the most striking things that one of the men who had been in the atrium as a child shared and initially the children who came to Sophia and Jana were from wealthier Roman families. Now it, it's even in places like Africa where they're using, you know, corrugated cardboard for altars. But in, in its early days, um, these children came from very wealthy families. And so they were used to seeing things of beauty and things of, of, rich, of richness and exquisite items. But what this man shared when he came back to celebrate uh, Sophia is that everything was always so beautiful. Sophia, and it was for us. Yeah, I love I love that, and I think that that's exactly the the atrium that I worked in. That was exactly their focus was to make every work that the child engaged in, whether it was little figurines, 
of the good shepherd and the sheep and a sheepfold, or whether it was prayer cards that were illuminated with colored backgrounds and gold lettering, um, or whether it was just the pots of potted flowers and, and the uh, little watering cans in their practical life area, whatever aspect of the atrium it was, it was made with great care. So one of the things that's really distinctive about the uh, atrium catechesis environment is that the catechists themselves make the materials for the children. They are part of the, they are not just commissioning an artist to make the figures or purchasing them. They themselves are often creating paper mache and, and painting the different figures or creating a, a scene of Jerusalem in paper mache that the children will will move the, their little figures through to to you know go through these uh, scriptural experiences and so that aspect of not just focusing on a beautiful environment but also engaging yourself as a catechist in the creating of the environment i think is is a really key part of it one of the reasons that uh, sophia wanted the catechist to be to make the materials was to help them uh step out of the busy and the hecticness and the pace of adult life and really slow down and enter into the uh, quiet and calm that is an essential characteristic of the atrium. So that act of making the materials for the children and then inviting the children to engage with them, I think is, is a key part of that, um, is of that environment. But practically, I'll speak a little bit to how a lot of atriums are structured. I, I can speak to mine and then I love the other panelists to jump in if theirs were different. There's usually a practical life area where the children um, gain discipline in their body and they learn to do activities to care for themselves and to care for their environment. So there might be a washer board where they learn to wash cloth. There's a little sink. There's, as I said, potted plants and watering cans, and the children are in charge of watering the plants and making sure they stay alive. They take responsibility for their environment. They're in charge of cleaning the environment to keep it beautiful and to keep it peaceful. So this practical life area, there's a set of lessons that are specifically designed to teach the child or to help the child develop mastery over their body and, and um, skill in all these important things like how to pour correctly or how to wipe correctly. And then there's an area of the atrium that is um, a prayer corner. And then there's uh, an area of the atrium that is more focused on the liturgy. So it'll have all the different, and we'll talk more about this, but all the different components of the, um, the liturgical vestments and the articles of the mass. And then there's another section of the area that's focused on, at least for the level one atrium, that's, I'm speaking of the level one atrium, I should caveat that, that's um, you know, focused on the parables and the scripture stories. And that will have shelves with the different figurines, as I said, that the children can use to, to move through the scripture stories and engage with them in more depth. So there's different areas of the atrium that the child can move through depending on what activity they choose to engage in. Do they wanna go sit with the Lord? They can go into the quiet of the prayer corner and light a candle. Do they want to go clean up and they wanna move around and they wanna water the plants? You know, or do they wanna sit down and read a story? There's, they'll move to a different environment depending on what, what they're led to engage with. Okay. Something I'd love to add uh, to what Joan Claire was saying about the making of the materials. I remember in my formation to have a bunch of catechists all around with Sculpey clay mm -hmm. trying to form the 12 apostles is what I remember from one of them. And all of us <laughs> are trying to get the facial structures of the 12 apostles um, right um, <laughs> because they have a little... Um, there is the Last Supper, and so you need little, um, the 12 apostles, you know, little three inch 12 apostles that the three to six year olds will use it in level one. And so the behind the scenes, we're building this for the atrium. And so I just remember my formation, all of us having this Sculpey play, clay and, and trying to get it right and then be like, okay, you know, which apostle does this one look like? You know, is this, is this Peter? You know, this one looks like John. Um, and, and so it's just, it, it's, 
so cool you don't have a lot of formation like that where you can sit around and form to the artistry behind it and then you put all this these hours into making these materials for these kids and trying to get it right and yeah it's a form of prayer to just get to be able to make these it's a whole different level and step of catechesis is sitting with these materials and creating them and forming them then you have to you know bake it and then you get to paint paint it um and all of these steps that uh, having come from monastic life um in the cloister our work is often forms of art in a lot of monasteries it's getting to make icons it's getting to do silent work to be with christ and to give your work to him, to give it back. And so to get to do that before you even teach the kids and be in, in the in the atrium with them, it's that step before that of we are entering into prayer by being able to create these in, in silence or chatting with whoever's making one as well. You have both because some people are making them at their home by themselves when they have the time. But in my group, it was all of us making these 12 apostles together. And so I just remember that that moment. But there's just this prayerfulness and getting to create with your hands this work of making it and then the, the kids getting to use it later. It's a great act of humility. John Agobi said that the most important characteristic for the catechist, and I think it is for us as parents too, is humility. And I myself am not very artistic. And my husband was deployed and things were a little bit difficult. And I was making the, in the level two, the six through nine year olds work with a parable material, the 10 bridesmaids. And I'm painting these 10 bridesmaids and they're two dimensional figures because they're parables. And I'm thinking, how am I going to do justice to the face of the bridegroom and to the faces of these 10 bridesmaids? And that was my oasis at the end of every day after the house was finally settled down and I would go up into the schoolroom and go over to my atrium table and I would paint these 10 bridesmaids and I had to make sure they all matched, you know, as exactly as possible because the only thing distinguishing them are the lit lamps and the unlit lamps. But it was such a time of peace and humility because I, I, had to redo faces several times but that act of making the materials ourselves really allows us to be prayerful as you said jamie but also to be very humble sophia and jana had a humility closet any material that they put in front of the children that the children did not respond to prayerfully was taken off the shelf and put away you know I think especially as moms, but as dads too, we come up with these great ideas sometimes, don't we? And we think, oh, this is gonna be fabulous. My children are gonna love it. And sometimes they do. And then other times it just, boom, falls flat. And we kind of take it personally. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, why didn't that work, Lord? Mm -hmm. But Sophia and Jana didn't even hesitate. If the children didn't respond to something, they just put it away. And they called it their humility closet. Yeah, aptly named. Do you think the things are going to go over so well? <laughs> nope, not so much. <laughs> Missed that one. Okay. I think kids have a way of seeing things completely differently than we do. Uh, for example, we have you have a map of Israel in the atrium that you create, and you're you're molding this, uh, you know, and creating it and painting it. Um, but then when it's in the atrium, you know, they just see a map of Israel. But you know, you're seeing, oh, I, I messed up on this little part that I created, and that you know, are they going to notice this? And and they don't they don't notice those things that you're like, oh, I messed up how I made this. They they think completely differently and then they'll see the beauty of some aspect of it that you didn't even think of and that just it ties into how the atrium is it's these kids are so close to god that there's from their innocence and their purity that they'll make these these little one-liners um observing something in the atrium and it makes us just step back as the adults of wow they they teach us so much which is beautiful yeah i I love that i love i remember um, that Sophia and Ziana said that their benchmark was for for whether a work was you know a, a particular lesson if you want to call it that that they were creating was effective or not was joy 
they were always looking for joy as the response of the child. And that's such a neat, um, a neat benchmark to have as a teacher, as a parent to say, is, is what we're experiencing together evoking a response of joy, a, a response of prayerfulness, a response of peace and letting it, I think that's one of the things I love so much about CGS, letting it be a child led engagement. We're not interpreting for them how they should view this map of Israel, right? Or how they should engage with this. We're letting, we're presenting the scripture and we're presenting the materials we've prepared. And that's part of that humility that um, Michelle was talking about. And, and they are um, engaging with it, right? They are choosing how to understand it and how to engage with it. So to me, that's how it's more, it's child-led and it's Holy Spirit-led and we're getting out of the way to some, to some extent. I think that's what makes it unique to a lot of other catechesis that is more teacher-led. And by child-led, we certainly never mean, sometimes this clarification is important, that the children rule the roost, right? Mm -hmm. But that, you know, they're kind of taking us by the hand and, and showing us what they need. And, and we as the adults, we, we are important. Jana said that the adult is a very important part of the environment. So we, we have to proclaim the word to them because the three to six-year-old child can't read scripture on their own. You or I might hear the, the Sunday gospel and go home that evening and sit down again with it and contemplate it and think about it in light of father's homily. The young child who is a pre-reader isn't able to do that. So the adult is a crucial part of the environment, but we step out of the way as soon as that role is fulfilled. And we say that the, the true teacher in the atrium is the Holy Spirit. I was leading a formation for a school and it was so beautiful to see teachers who are used to being in teacher mode all of the time with their students letting go of that. And it was such a relief for them. They were talking about the peace that they anticipated having, taking their students into the atrium and just being able to let go of that teacher role for a little while and allowing God to take over. And I think even in the, the lessons that you're giving in the atrium, it's a different version of teaching that coming from having taught and then going into the atrium, it's a different style because it's in the Montessori environment, but it's, it's taught in a prayerful way, like the pedagogy behind it is very prayerful. We often use so many words in teaching that we want to explain everything and, and we could teach, you know, we want to put so much knowledge, pour this knowledge into the head of this five-year-old and catechesis <laughs> yeah. of the good shepherd is the opposite completely of that. And if you watch a, a well-trained catechist show the model altar to a three-year-old. So this is a little baby altar that you can picture and there's a little baby chalice and little baby candles. Um, and you're, you're presenting this to them for the first time. And there are so few words in a in a what you would, a lesson um, that you are giving. You're repeating a lot of words. You are holding up the chalice and saying the word chalice, and you're repeating just the simple words, and then you're placing it onto the altar, you know. And then you're getting from your little model sacristy um, the paten, and you're just saying paten. You're holding it up and saying one word. It's that simple. Um, and placing it onto the altar. So they are seeing it, being immersed in it, getting to feel it. Um, you're using all your senses, but it just leaves the room for the Holy Spirit to move because it is very silent and they're able to bring it into their prayer life. Yeah, I love that because and I think it's a really good point to make that yeah, we, are, we, are, we are important in the environment. It was very important um, in the atrium to set up the environment and the behavioral environment for the children well in the beginning of the year. It was very, very important that we established the ways of being in the atrium that were different from in our homes or in other environments. We spoke in a, in a low voice and we moved slowly and we didn't play with the altar pieces or play mass, right? We did the work of the lessons 
um, and we didn't we didn't do whatever we wanted with the different uh, materials. We did the lesson as it was shown us by the catechist. And so that aspect of learning how to be in the atrium in this peaceful, calm, quiet way and how to use the materials well and respectfully was a really important part of what created a prayerful, peaceful environment. Because, yeah, if we'd let the children just run around and be as loud as they wanted to, it wouldn't be an environment where the children could pray or could, you know, really come to to um, encounter the Holy Spirit in the same way. So it's such a good such a good point because that's a difference. We often have little play altar stuff in our homes, but it's different for a child to play mass than to learn the names and lessons of the object and prepare the altar and then put it away, which is more how you engage with the articles of the liturgy in the atrium. John Gobi said that the atrium is a place where work becomes prayer and contemplation. And so it's through the children's work in the atrium that they encounter God. Because in order to enter contemplation, in order to enter into reflective prayer, we need to be able to still our bodies. And still bodies are probably the last thing any of us think of when we think of a two and a half to three year old child, yeah. or even getting into the infant toddler atrium. People hear that who have been in an older child atrium and say, how do you do this with toddlers? But when all of the child's needs are being met, they are truly able to, according to their age, enter into that silence and that stillness. And the environment that we create cultivates that and allows space for that to happen. We've had uh, movers and shakers come into the atrium that I've served in and they end up saying the most profound things that just blow us as catechists away. We had a little girl who was three years old and she came into the atrium and by the middle of the year, she still was struggling to pour rice from one pitcher into another. It would just spill all over the place. And then when spills happen in the atrium, the children restore it themselves. We don't as catechists go rushing to their aid. And so oftentimes the entire two hour atrium session, their work time is usually about an hour and a half. Oftentimes that whole hour and a half, she would spend pouring rice and cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. But at our altar um, at, at this atrium, we would often sing after we lit the candles and sat there with the children, we would sing the Celtic Alleluia with the children. And they loved to sing the Alleluia. I know it's Lent, but I have to <laughs> give me permission for a moment to do, <laughs> say the forbidden word during Lent. Um, so one day her, her family was at mass and they sang the Celtic Alleluia. And she leaned over to her mom and dad and announced triumphantly, this is my Alleluia. It's my Alleluia. So the children, something profound is, is happening in them. And even those movers and shakers are, are experiencing our Lord. It's beautiful to see some of the, the kids who are rambunctious usually, and then they come into the atrium and they ha they, they're just calm. It, it just, it, it, there's something about it. They, it takes time to build to that point, but um, there's something about when you walk, when you watch the environment and watch each of these kids doing their own work, and as the guide, the teacher, you can sit back and see there is a child who is dusting off the plants and and super. Joan Claire talked about the joy, like joyful to dust plants, <laughs> you know. And then you have another child on the other side of the room who is washing the windows because these are works that they are able to do in the atrium, and and washing of the windows. And at least my atrium was the favorite task, you know. And it's and you think of okay, yeah, come wash my windows at my house, right. please feel free. But these <laughs> these children love to do these works and mm -hmm. feel like they they are contributing and they're learning and they get to you know use the squeegee. They get to. Um, um, just they get to wash a table, they get to wash it, just all of these tasks, the practical life that they're doing in the atrium, and they do it quietly and calmly. And yeah, a lot of times it, 
the children will surprise you because you see them, you know, outside running around or in the classroom, but then they come to the atrium and they know it is this sacred space. It is separate. It's different. And it's, it's prayerful. Uh, it's just completely different to, to see it and see their transition and what they're learning, not from our words. It's, it's God working in, through their work that they're able to do. Yeah. Well, I think one of, one of the, I love that. I think one of the interesting things about the whole approach is that in a typical educational environment, we see the teacher and the student as like the two main players. And I think part of the insight of Sophia and Gianna was, and, and to some extent Maria Montessori herself, was this idea of the environment itself as a third player. And so I don't think it's an accident how they love washing the windows or dusting the plants or cleaning or caring for the environment. Um, one of the things that I love, and I think this is something that we can use to bring the environment home um, if we want to create some of this spirit in our own homes is, is that all of the materials are child size, right? So that the, the squeegee and the watering can, as I said, and the washer board and everything is, is their height, their size, they can get to it. And this is intentional as a way to enable them to own the environment as their own, to take responsibility for the environment. And I think we often underestimate the capacity that the child has for work and dignity in their work and respect. Too often in our culture, we kind of diminish all that they do by, by calling it play and, and seeing it you know, in a light that doesn't really recognize what they're capable of. And I think by having an environment that respects their size, by having everything just the right size for them um, and respects their abilities by having works that help them grow their motor skills um, back to the rice and the, the pouring of the rice, they respond so eagerly to that respect that we're giving and hence this joyful engagement in, in their work. So I don't think it's an accident at all. It's part of that careful crafting of the environment. Joan Claire, you bring to my mind a story about a little girl in the atrium. <clears throat> she was four years old and her family had a sudden death. Uh, her aunt suddenly died at a, as a very young woman. And as we all have you may have experienced ourselves, right? That kind of throws our world into a tailspin. And this little girl's mom had to fly across the country to be with um, her mother and her other sister. And uh, dad stayed behind with the children. And her mom said, please, if, if you do nothing else, make sure that the two little ones get to the atrium. I really don't want them to miss. And so the next day or, or two days later this little four-year-old girl comes into the atrium and her hair's all messed up not neatly groomed as it usually is and she just had a very drawn uh, face you know from her perspective mom was just suddenly gone and lots of people in her house were crying and her whole world was in in turmoil after our gathering time we gather with the children when they first enter into the atrium and then we dismiss them to work. She immediately went to the Good Shepherd table. So on a little table, we have all the materials for the Good Shepherd, the parable from John chapter 10. And she had already received this presentation from the catechist, and so she was free to work with it whenever she wanted. So she immediately went over to the Good Shepherd, and I followed her and offered to read the scripture booklet to her. And she said, yes, please. So I began to read the scripture and she brought the good shepherd out and had all of the sheep following behind him as they, they moved around the sheepfold. And we got to the end of the scripture booklet and she had all of the sheep back in the sheepfold. And she looked at me and she said, again. So we read the scripture booklet again. And this time her movements were slower, more deliberate. Um, she looked more peaceful. We got to the end of the scripture booklet and all the sheep were back in the sheepfold with the good shepherd. And she said, again. Mm -hmm. And so we read it again. We read it eight times in a row. We read the scripture booklet eight times in a row. And with each retelling of this scripture, 
she you could see the peace filling her and the change in her demeanor and by the time we were finished she had this little tiny smile on her face but eight times we read that scripture together and the good shepherd was truly ministering to her heart right this relationship she knew him to call her by name she was in love with the good shepherd and had encountered him before and so in her time of turmoil and stress uh, she met him exactly where where she needed him and he ministered to her heart wow that brings tears to my eyes yeah. oh, so beautiful and they will they'll so often um have uh, certain phrases that they'll repeat after you when you're doing especially the good shepherd i remember this one uh, child that i was doing that same lesson with and she well, with the phrase she kept saying in response is she'd say and they and he i forget if i have this quite right but he knows them by name and she would repeat that right the rest of the story she just listened but she was you, you could tell in her little four-year-old um, heart and soul, she was meditating on the Good Shepherd knowing his sheep by name. And that meant a lot to her that he knew her by name. And so it's just amazing to be a witness as a catechist to their capacity for contemplation and their capacity to engage with the scriptures. And the children actually showed the name of this approach on their own. You know, Sophia and Jana didn't set out saying, we're going to invent something called Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. <laughs> they didn't refer to it as anything really in the beginning. And then for a while it was referred to as the parable method. So that's a, a beautiful point of reflection. And then after they noticed that the parable of the Good Shepherd was what the three to six year old children and this all of the children just gravitated to all of the time. And yes, the Good Shepherd provides protection and we think, okay, children want to feel safe, they want to feel protected. But the thing that seemed to resonate the most with the children is that his knowing me by name. And this makes sense because even especially young children, they have a tremendous capacity for relationship. Right? That's how they form who they are and where they belong in the world is through relationship. And so eventually in the 80s, it wasn't until the 80s, I believe, a bishop from Mexico said, you know, I think that we need to call this the catechesis of the Good Shepherd because that is the one that the children love the most. So the children are the ones who even named uh, this approach. Sweet. So Bonnie, I'm thinking that by now, the parents who are listening at home are probably thinking, so do you mean to say that I need to have an entire space in my house <laughs> devoted to, to this? Yep. What am Start I supposed to do? Am I supposed down. to be yeah. Yeah, sculpting apostles <laughs> and painting bridesmaids? That's right. And... <laughs> Good. That's right. Yeah. Good project for tonight. That's right. Yeah. Get your stuff ready. Okay. Yeah. This sounds terrifying because crafts are something which just scare me half to death. <laughs> um, and this sounded like a lot of crafts, but um, well, this sounds wonderful. Now hearing your stories today, it's like, you know, this really sounds wonderful. And so you talked a little bit about the benefits again and, and the, the reason behind the program, but it, it might be, it'd be nice to explore the, you know, the why the benefits of the program a little bit more, if you would. I think that god always makes flowers bloom in the desert right and so in this desert of covid times uh, there's been a shift at the national association for catechesis of the good shepherd who are still very much devoted to making this experience available to as many not just children but adults as possible but when you before covid before you went to the cgs usa website uh, it used to say, find an atrium. That's the thing that used to be on their homepage that stood out the most, find an atrium. And as you mentioned, Bonnie, atria are not available everywhere because you need devoted catechists um, and a space to make, it, to make it happen. But now when you go to the website, uh, the focus is the domestic church. And I think that that's one of the beautiful flowers that have come out of this desert of COVID times is that the National Association had to say, okay, 
atria all over the country, all over the world are closed, what are families supposed to do? So I say all of that just because uh, you don't have to sculpt apostles and paint bridesmaids and have an entire atrium set up in your house for this to be of benefit to your family. Uh, for me, myself, I know that I am not the same wife and mother that I was before because of the transformation that I've gone through, through my work in, in catechesis. And my family's faith life, the practices that we have as a, a family have been transformed and renewed and changed as well. Uh, one of the ways that you can take all of these different beautiful principles, these underpinnings of CGS and allow them to grow your family too, your children and your own faith life is first and foremost to have a quiet prayer space, a prayer corner set up in your house. This could be as simple as taking a little table or a bookshelf or something that you already have. And our first family prayer table was a little corner table with a purple napkin, cloth napkin on it because I don't sew and I had nothing bigger. My, well, my tablecloth, but that was too big. So it's so simple to do. And on that prayer table, you can put a Bible and a candle and a little statue or a rosary or something to communicate to the whole family that um, God is the center of this family, and this is a special place that we've set aside um, to encounter him, because encountering him is the most important thing that we can do any day. So that would be the first step, would be to have a place in your home where anyone can go at any time of the day to encounter him through prayer and through the word. To piggyback a little bit on that, I think one of the ways that the atrium can be brought into your home um, or the the spirit of the catechesis approach can be brought into your home is to develop little rituals too around the reading of scripture that are really powerful so i know for us with the prayer table um, just a couple ways we set it up uh, emphasized importance of uh, the importance of the bible so if you can put the bible on a little cushion or a little stand it can kind of give it um, an extra element of importance um, and then having a cushion there for the child to sit on can make it comfortable. So there's little things like that. But, but one of the bigger things is in the actual reading of scripture, we always light a candle first before we begin to read the scripture, because this is the word of God. And it brings this sacredness to this moment. We're going to light a candle and then we're going to open up the word of God. And we're going to sit on our cushion. We're going to be comfortable and we're going to read this prayerfully slowly focusing on every word and i think little rituals like that where every time you're going to read the scripture with your child they light the candle and teach them to light the candle back to that importance of respecting their capacity to do real work and to handle you know objects that require care so little that's not you know that's something any of us can do they don't always require as you said big um, paper mache works, but just the, the concept of having rituals around your activities. I also think another thing that can be helpful in the home is um, having materials accessible to them, having an art shelf or where they can make prayer cards, for example, for that prayer table. The prayer card might say amen and it might have a, you know, a purple background with a a smaller white section and then you have you know gold markers or something where they can make something very beautiful and simple but the child themselves can go to that shelf take the work down make the prayer card and then some people will have a little basket on the table that they can put their prayer cards in and the child can take out whichever prayer card they want because sometimes they might might want alleluia sometimes they might need um, be still and know that i am god you know there's different little verses that you can write there, um, but both to have prayer cards and to, and to have an art shelf that's accessible to the child for them to be able to build and contribute to that altar, I think is another neat, simple way to begin to bring this prayerfulness into your home. On that note, I see in the atrium, 
that the children love processions. And so for processions, we might give one child the Bible, one child a statue of Our Lady, one child a rosary, different pieces that will go on the prayer table. And then we process in the room and then they each get to place those items on the prayer table while we're singing a song. And, and they love these processions. Um, and it's just having a moment to, to sing and to walk together and um, and then to find their seat at the prayer table and then it is a little bit of a prayer service. This is something that is easy to do with your whole family. One person reads the scripture and then we often in the atrium at the prayer table, something that resonates with me is just song in general. And often we will say to the children, is there a song that comes to mind for you? After a little bit of silence, you know, you read scripture, everyone's sitting around the prayer table and we'll just let the Holy Spirit move and there's just quiet. And then sometimes a little, you know, a little girl will sing this little light of mine or something, you know, and the light is Christ, right? And so they're bringing up songs from what they know. Um, but then often there is, there are a lot of songs that we sing in the atrium that just resonate with them. And you'll hear them just singing these songs throughout the day. Someone like a kid is humming in the corner. He's at the model altar and he is singing one of the songs that we were singing. And just music in general is another, another thing, another element that you can use in your home that children, especially just, it, it really resonates with them. I think I'm starting to understand your statement, Jamie, earlier on about this being like a monastery. And as, as I was starting Lent, I was reading a book about the spiritual life by Brad Petrie, and he was talking about these, you know, you should be starting every day reading scripture and then meditating on it and then being quiet. And it just called to mind that in my prayer life, you know, just speaking personally, it's it always ends up being fitting it in, you know, I'm busy, stop prayer. Okay. Stop, run off and do things. And as you're talking about these beautiful atriums and these experiences, it's like this longing for quiet and stillness is just growing. And me, it's like, I want this in my home. I want this place where we stop running around for a little bit and just be quiet and still or, and deliberate about what we're doing that listen, that being open to actually receiving something rather than just kind of babbling at, at our Lord for a few minutes and then running off and, and getting back into the busyness of my day. Beautiful. It sounds beautiful. It really is, yeah. And I think you're hitting on a really key thing because as, as Michelle talked in the beginning, this is a shared religious experience, both for the adult and the child. And so we two need to slow down and enter into that meditative contemplative quiet space in order to you know in order to also be in this in in this prayerful space it's not we're not just inviting the child into it and leaving them there no we enter into it with them um in a in a really key way so i love that i think that we as parents can sometimes feel a little intimidated uh by providing this for our families because we we listen to that little voice of doubt in our heads that tells us well you don't have a theology degree or you don't know enough about the faith or you left the church for a while and so you're unworthy to do this with your children in one of the atria where i served we used to have parent workshops every couple of months and we would give a presentation to the parents as their children receive it and then we would have an adult reflection afterwards and this one mom came up to me afterwards with tears in her eyes and she said can i do what you just did with my daughter can mm -hmm. i just sit down with her and just read the bible she felt so ill-equipped she felt unqualified and i said yes please sit down with her every day and and read scripture with her um, in our family we mentioned processions jamie you were talking about how much they love processions my college age children still um when it's the change of the liturgical season, the Kims are processing around the house to change the color of the cloth on our prayer table and singing a song that they've chosen and putting our new items on the prayer table. And there's something very powerful about that experience together. And there's also something 
very powerful about sitting down and reading a passage of scripture, short if you have small children, a little bit longer if you have a mixture or older children, and to just sit in silence afterwards and then to say, what did you hear? And to see what our children have to say because they were listening to God is speaking to them too. During one of these moments, during an Advent uh, prayer time as a family, our three-year-old who was in an atrium as well at the time, we had our scripture reading. We read one of the Messianic prophecies and afterwards our four-year-old said, or three, I forget, he was three or four at the time. And during our prayer time afterwards, he said, oh Jesus, I love you. You are the Prince of Peace. And that wasn't even the prophecy that we had read together as a family that time, but he had heard that prophecy as well during our family prayer times and during um, during the atrium. And so we're putting into their hearts this prayer language too through the scripture that we listen to and read with them. But each one of us, when we took our children to be baptized, the priest prayed over us, right, as the mother and as the father. And we know that we are the primary educators of our children in the faith. And so we don't need a theology degree. <laughs> We've already received that commission from our Lord and the grace to, to do that, to be able to just sit with them and listen to the Lord with them. And I sometimes think we overcomplicate it because we think we need to yes. interpret the scriptures for them, or we think we need to impart, as Jamie said, we need to pour the information into them. And so I think one of the things that can really help take the stress off of you as a parent is you don't have to have the answers, right? Like you said, if you read a scripture passage, what did you hear? And sometimes the child has a response, and sometimes they don't. And it's okay if they don't. You don't have to give them a response. In fact, don't. Let, let them, if their response is silence, that is a beautiful contemplative response. And, and I think that that's a really just important aspect of, I, I know with, as an artist, I'll speak to this side, I know um, that in the artistic work of children in the environment, it's very, very important when they make a work of art and they bring it to you that you respond in a way that welcomes what they did but doesn't dictate meaning to them so you say that's beautiful or i like it and that's it you don't comment don't say oh you drew a giraffe right because you don't maybe they didn't <laughs> you know and it's that aspect of i think whether it's reading the scriptures or whether it's responding with appreciation to what they have honored you by sharing with you in a work of art, just letting yourself not be so worried about what you're contributing and not feeling like you need to interpret the scriptures to them, um, but just letting them give you their responses and let that be enough. So it's simpler than we make it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious a little bit about that as well, because again, with my not liking crafts and then as we're going through it and I keep thinking oh I can't do this because we don't really sing a lot in our family very much and um so you you've given us the prayer table and it's like okay I can do that we can do the prayer table um but for maybe other parents like myself uh you know, don't overthink it uh, Joan Claire you you mentioned that but what other how do you overcome some of these uh apprehensions I guess about this or what are the most important things we should do first to, to kind of overcome that. I think it, if you can find other families near you, um, I think that's a practical way if you're all on board and would like to start CGS. I think if there is if there is an atrium near you, wherever you are, even if it's a half hour drive, like it, it's worth it. Like sign up your kids today, like sign up. There's three levels for those of you who don't know, three to six year olds, six to nine year olds, nine to 12 year olds. And so if there is an atrium and you can find it, um, find one, I'd say do that. But everyone has different gifts and God knows that. So when I was doing like my training, there are the artsy people and then there's the not so artsy people. And so it's kind of, you're working together with what skills you have to form your kids. And so you're gonna have, you might have one mom that is like, oh, oh, I am so excited to make all of these things. Um, and then there's things in an atrium that you also have to find. Um, like you might need to find a little table so you can go thrift store shopping to find a little table, to find a little candle. There's all these pieces 
that it takes time to get all of these things. And so that could be one person's job, you know, is finding these things. Another person is the making. Um, another person really likes to actually lead the, the, the teaching portion. So I think if there's other families who also are on board, you also, you can use all of your skills and, and backgrounds to, to start something. And it's just one step at a time. If you can make one lesson, make just start with the altar, just the model altar in your family. Depends what age your, your child is, but just starting with the altar, I'd say, is a very important one. And getting all the pieces for that one and making that one really well and then moving on to learning about another one and then working on that one. And just on a super practical level, the um, the CGS website has a lot of um, directions for different lessons that you can build um, materials in the home. As as Michelle said, they've made that domestic church and that sense of how can you bring the atrium home a key part of the website. So cgsusa.org is the website, and that has a lot of resources and you could look amongst them and say, oh, that one's too hard for us right now. But like that one I could do because it's just things I can pick up or buy from a thrift store and let yourself accumulate. Um, if you set up the area in your house that you want to be this corner or this atrium area, little by little, you can begin to add to it. It's not like you have to, you know, build the whole atrium in a year of your of your life. And if you have older children, you may not be making any of these um, hands-on materials at all, but still having, as I said, our youngest now is 12, which boggles my mind, but we have 12 all the way up through 30 now, and we still have those processions. They, they love those. We've talked a lot about scripture, and uh, that other pillar of CGS is liturgy. And so I think, Stephen, if your family isn't a singing family, that's okay. Maybe you just, uh, during Advent and Lent, uh, you don't sing to show the penitential uh, nature of those seasons. But in order to incorporate that pillar of liturgy into your family, uh, celebrate the liturgical year together. And so maybe the only thing your family ever sings is a hearty Alleluia at, during the Easter season and sing the Alleluia that your parish usually sings every Sunday at mass. I'm sure that you guys all know that one. Right. <laughs> so that's right. something that, that you can sing. And at Christmas, sing Silent Night or your family's favorite Christmas song. So music doesn't have to be a part of it um, in the family, but it certainly can become a rich part of it. Uh, but to develop that pillar of liturgy in your family, some other things that you can do is when you go to mass together to sit in the front. Joan Claire, I loved your your story earlier about seeing all those little ones in the front. Sit in the front, especially if you have little ones, because otherwise it just looks like they're in that place where mom and dad get upset with me. And all I can see is the backs of really tall people. So <laughs> the mass is for them to so sit in the front, get there early. Uh, and then something that's been very fruitful in my own family is that we've developed these Sabbath dinners. And so every Saturday night, we put a tablecloth on the table and we put out two candles and we light the candles and we read the readings for that Sunday together and we reflect on them as a family. So it doesn't have to be that elaborate. It's pretty laid back actually in our family you know we're eating and we're reading scripture and we're talking and going off on tangents and but those sabbath dinners are sometimes an hour to an hour and a half long now that our children are older so that's a very fruitful way that you can make uh, both the liturgy and scripture come alive in your family and we have this beautiful liturgical year in our church and so to really latch on to that and to celebrate that in your home I think the reason that those children were so engaged in the mass is that because of through the atrium environment, they had learned all of the different um, articles of the mass. They'd learned about the ciborium, the paten, the chasuble. They'd learned the vestments. They'd learned the the um, you know everything on the altar, and so they. And then they've learned all the liturgical seasons as well. They learned the colors. There's songs in the atrium that go through the different the different colors, or there's um, little vestments they can hang on these hangers. And so, because they had learned in great depth all about 
all the components of the mass, they were looking for it. That was a big part of their engagement, right? And they were proud of themselves for knowing what it was and sometimes whispering to their mom, you know, that's, that's, that's the pattern. And, and they learned the epiclesis gesture, you know, and they, so they learned these key components of that pillar of the liturgy. And so even if you, you don't have all those little atrium materials, I think, again, back to the spirit of it, right? The spirit is the scripture and this reverence and joy in the scripture and then the the liturgy and the sacramental life um so just helping model for them yourself um and and invite them into a deep knowledge and a deep love for all the components of the mass I and mean, i think things like serving at the altar is a way that many boys engage with with that knowledge but for a lot of girls that isn't something they encounter and so that can be part of even just family study Yes. At the school I taught at, we had level one, two, and three, and it was really beautiful to see that the students who had gone through all these levels of formation, um, the high schoolers then came back and went through the training, and then they were the ones assisting with the three to six year olds, the six to nine year olds. So they actually experienced it and then wanted, loved it so much that they wanted to come back and, and be trained in it so that they could do it themselves, which was such a, a witness and a testimony to see high schoolers leading these little ones in it. Indeed, yeah, that's wonderful. And you'll hear those high schoolers too. It's always beautiful when they come through to have the teens and young adults come through the formation to become catechists themselves. And you'll hear some of them sometimes say, you know, I want to be able to do this for my own children someday. And so there's this very unspoken uh, fruitfulness for vocational discernment within within the atrium. You know, we've mentioned a few times now the different levels, and I talked about how central for the three to six year old child that relationship with God is. And then you see that slowly blossoming in the six through nine year old child. They're kind of looking around and saying, oh, okay, I'm not the only sheep in this sheepfold. You know, I, I wonder how the good shepherd wants me to treat these other sheep that are in the sheepfold with me. And so you have this beautiful moral formation that begins with that, that child who's at the age of reason now. And then for the nine through 12 year old child, you know, they very much are looking at the good shepherd as, you know, this role model of virtue and sacrifice. And they, we know that that age child, you know, they want these heroes, right? They want these mentors that they can look up to. And so they look at the good shepherd and they go, okay, so this good shepherd whom I'm in love with and, and have this relationship with, uh, he laid down his life for his sheep. So how might he be calling me to lay down my life uh, for others? And so you have these seeds of, of vocational uh, discernment there in the children. And then that continues to grow into the adolescent and into young adulthood. One of my favorite things to share with people about CGS is that, um, you know, it's very easy to grow up and turn your back on an institution and a set of rules. But it's much more difficult to turn your back on someone whom you love. And so when our faith formation of our children begins in relationship, we're growing in them, helping to cultivate in them a lifelong faith journey uh, with our Lord that hopefully they will never forsake. Uh, it's the only time that gravity doesn't work, right? Is that <laughs> when we start with the head knowledge, a lot of times it's really hard for that to make its way into the heart. But when we start with the heart, it defies gravity and, and the heart, you know, blossoms into head knowledge and, and intellectual knowledge of the faith as well. Very true. Sure seems, Stephen, we've had a number of episodes here in the past, in this springtime season here, these themes of beauty and liturgical living and vocation and discernment, these keep coming up over and over. It's uh, very much Holy Spirit active. Yes, definitely. Okay, so check out our show notes for links to these things that we have covered and the, the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd website. Has anything else come to mind as we've been talking that you wanted to include? 
Yes, for me, I think in the education of kids, it comes back to what I was talking about before of like just pouring knowledge into the head of a child. But I think for parents, the, the ultimate goal of everything is to get your children to heaven. And that, that's the root of everything. And how do we do this? I think fundamentally, like we need to teach them how to pray. And yes, it's, it's the liturgy, it's scripture, but it, it's prayer. And so how do we teach prayer? I think Catechesis of the Good Shepherd is huge in everything is steeped in prayer. And so if you can give that huge gem to your child, you will do just, you will do just fine. Like you want them to get to heaven. So it's not all the math and let's get the science and let's get all of this. Um, but if you can teach them to know Christ and to be with Christ and to put a little time of silence in every day, uh, that's what it what it comes down to it's like reorienting so that you realize that that's the focus of everything one of my favorite movies is a movie on the life of saint philip neary and it's all these little kids and they are singing and neary has taught them this song and it's preferisco paradiso um it's i prefer heaven and they're singing it over and over. I prefer heaven. I prefer heaven. It's all these little kids. And that's our goal as catechists and as parents is we want them to choose heaven, to choose everything that they're doing needs to be oriented toward that and for that, to have Our Lady and Our Lord and the saints on your side. Well said. We need these perspective checks to help us write this perspective. And when we get into the minutia of things, yes. I did want to mention one thing. I, I want to encourage parents not to be afraid to modify what's been given to us by our church for your own family's needs. Okay. And as an example, I give Liturgy of the Hours. Years and years and years ago, our priest gave my husband and me the Liturgy of the Hours morning prayer as our Lenten practice together as a couple. And I fell in love with Liturgy of the Hours, but if any of you ever tried praying Liturgy of the Hours before, it can be very intimidating and very daunting. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Uh, I fell so in love with the Liturgy of the Hours that I said, oh, I wanna pray night prayer together as a family. And so in those early days of praying night prayer together as a family, we prayed two parts. We prayed the into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. And we prayed the Canticle of Simeon. And that was it. We cut out the Psalms because sometimes they're very long and we had little ones. And that was all that they could have. So we gave them those two little pieces. And so we have this vast treasury of novenas and, and liturgical prayer and, and so many gifts that the church gives us. Take those gifts and modify them to fit the, the needs of your family and the ages of your children and where your family is in your faith journey. And look for that response of joy. Like, do your children respond to this or not? Because if they Amen. don't, don't force it, right? Wait for that. Because we too can cr craft our works to our children by looking for that response of joy. Thank you so much for coming to visit with us today, Joan Claire, Michelle, and Jamie. This has been lovely meeting you, Joan Claire and Jamie. Well, always good to see you, Michelle. Always great to visit with you. I hope you all will come back and visit with us soon. Thank you so much for introducing us to this program. It sounds wonderful. and We'll be looking for more good fruit coming from it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie and Stephen. Thank you. Subscribe to the Colby Cast on your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss an episode. And let us know how we're doing by leaving a rating or a review. And as always, feel free to email us at podcast at colby.org. Mary, our mother, pray for us. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Ad maiorem Dei Gloriam.